plane identification. They learn the various types of aircraft, just as a man in the Navy. A Navy commander conducts inspection, accompanied by a wave officer as his aide. They're training to become instructors in the teaching of gunnery to new men in the service. Good afternoon, my name is Mel Bloom. I am the Vice President of Women's Impressions with the B B-59 Living History Crew. And we uh, had a really good response to the last video we did. So we wanted to uh, expand on one of the topics we get the most questions on here on the ship and when we go out and interact with the public, and that would be our uniforms. One of the most common questions we get, not necessarily what were the waves or what are you doing here, is what are you wearing? Uh, is that from the time period? Did you travel in time? We get a lot of questions about that. A lot of the uniforms that we wear when we go out in to the public and here on the ship, a lot of these uniforms are from the time period. Uh, the one I'm wearing is an original and I've got a couple others behind me. Uh, the uniform, part of the reason it's so important to us to wear it when we interact with the public is because of how significant this uniform was for the women uh, in both, pretty much all branches of the military serving during World War II. Um, the uniform was also a sticking point uh, when they came to developing the waves because there was so much pushback about women serving and there was so much risk of bad reputation that when they were designing the uniform for the waves, they wanted to make sure that they were going to come up with something that was conservative and would appeal to most Americans and reinforce the idea that these are good American girls. They were going to be dressed well and for that reason makeup was not allowed and strict adherence to the uniform was very critical uh, for the success of the Navy. With recruitment starting at a lot of these women's colleges, uh, there was a lot of young women that ended up joining the Navy uh, because it was the best dressed branch of the military at the time. Um, the Marine Corps had not been uh, founded yet. They were, they were part of the 1942 legislation that authorized the waves, um, as were the SPARs, but at the time that the waves came into being in July of 42, the only other branch of the military was the WAX, the Women's Army Corps, and that's that uniform behind me. And there was a lot of concerns about ill-fitting uniforms, bad color lots. Uh, so the uniform for the wax was actually something that was a sticking point for people serving. When the Navy was recruiting, they knew that they could pull people away from deciding to go to the wax by joining the waves, by advertising that they had this uniform that was a glamorous, well-fitting outfit. They had hired a American fashion designer named Maine Boucher to come up with the smart navy blue suit. And you see a lot of recruitment pitches from this time in the 40s um, advertising that if you join the waves, you get $200 worth of free clothing. And coming out of a time where clothing had been hard to get because of the Great Depression and heading into ration years, uh, the idea of a full glamorous outfit that could be worn even after service was a major uh, selling point for a lot of the women. So one of the sources that we use to help identify what um, what we wear when we go to events is a document from 1943, it was the Uniform Guidelines, and that gives us a very clear idea of what uh, uniform pieces we should be wearing as educators. So one of the most common outfits you see with the waves is this blue suit. Um, you can see it with a white shirt and a black tie or a long sleeve navy blue, which is what I have on, and a purple tie. Um, and what's interesting about the tie is that it was actually originally going to be silk, but as rationing went on during the 40s, they switched to rayon. So some of the uniforms actually changed around 44, 45. And then as roles changed for the women in the Navy, they started out in many clerical jobs, so having a suit or a nice dress might have been a appropriate work item for them, but as they took on more factory roles and took on more hands-on work, that's when we start seeing the introduction of the aviation coverall 
and in 43 they decided that the women really needed a good work uniform. So they introduced a dungarees and chambray shirt uniform and up until they were able to fully implement that, they actually authorized the women to wear the men's dungarees and chambrays. So although we do have this one very dominant uniform which was used in all the recruiting and in the photos, you see this or the seersucker, the waves actually had quite a large wardrobe to choose from. So one of the other big things about wearing a uniform from the 1940s is I have all the pieces, I have uh, this document that says they were wearing this item. How do we figure out how to make it look right? How do we look like we walked out of a fashion plate from the 1940s? Um, and it really is a big compliment to us as educators when someone comes up to us and says, you look like my great grandmother, which normally not a compliment, but we love to hear it. We do a lot of research before we actually start wearing the uniforms to teach in because we want to make sure that we are doing justice and wearing them correctly. There was a lot of rules on how to wear the uniform and there's also so much importance behind wearing this uniform. And although there was definite variations in how it was worn depending on when in the war and where in the war depending on where they were stationed, one thing that remained consistent throughout the entire wartime period up until the Integrated Service Act of 49 is the importance of wearing it correctly. There was a lot of rules on what you could not do. Um, waves were not authorized to wear makeup and the red lip was very iconic for the 1940s but they couldn't wear red nail polish as well and they could not wear any more makeup than that. So the red lip would have been the extent of the makeup they were authorized to wear. There may have been some women who pushed that, but a lot of women did understand the importance of maintaining a good reputation for the waves. The wearing of the uniform became a huge source of pride. When you read some of these documents of women who served or read the rule books or a place like Quarters Day in Washington, there are a lot of reminders that wearing of the Navy uniform is essential to representing the Navy. If you, The way you wear the uniform is how you represent the Navy and how you represent this big experiment, honestly. Um, and if they had been sloppy with the uniform, if they had been uh, wearing it incorrectly or wearing it without pride, I think that would have had a pretty negative impact on how the waves were viewed. And the waves knew this. And it wasn't even just, am I wearing everything correctly? It was, are my shoes shined? Is my hat straight? Is my, you know, is my hair done neatly? Uh, Quarters D in Washington had extended laundry hours to make sure that every time they stepped out in their uniform it was neat, pressed, and ready to go. A lot of reasons we actually don't have too many is that when the war was over, a lot of them took these uniforms home, took the buttons off, and swapped out the insignia and wore them until they literally fell apart. Uh, so we do start seeing the blue uniforms are very hard to come by. Seersucker is even harder, but the women are very, very proud of these uniforms. And a lot of the primary sources we have about what women felt when they put on this uniform is they felt like they were a part of something. So for those of us who wear it now in the 21st century to teach about this, you can't wear this uniform without feeling that same sort of pride of what you're representing because of what it meant to them and how it played a part in the women becoming a part of the American war machine. And it was also the first time that women were allowed to serve in a uniform. We had women serving alongside the men in pretty much every single conflict in one way or another, usually nursing or um, in World War I we had the yeomanettes. But you never had a uniformed force. You never had women with military rank. So having rank was the other thing with the uniform too, is that the rank was kind of a new thing in that for a long time, a lot of the waves were only allowed to have authority over other waves. And especially true in the nurse corps was that they came in as officers, they would have lieutenant ranks, but their authority was only limited to other people within the Naval Nurse Corps. So to see the visual of having this uniform, what it stood for, how it felt, 
Um, imagine you have never seen women in the military. You've never heard of women serving in the military. And you're living in Northampton, Massachusetts, or in the Bronx in New York, and suddenly you've got hundreds of women marching down your street, deep little rows, in this uniform. That would have been pretty shocking at the time. I think we've become much more accustomed to seeing women in, in uniform, but in that sense we take it for granted. When they wanted to put the women in uniform and pull them from an auxiliary role, I think the uniform really was that final show of we're here, we're serving, and we're going to have a place alongside you, but also look what we can do. You can wear the uniform, we can do it too. You guys can salute, we can do it too. Navy 5952, hold your position, over. Anacostia Tower, this is Navy 5952, Wilco, out not just dress up for us. Um, we get that question a lot, like, oh, are you guys just dressing up or is this a cosplay? And it really isn't. Um, I know some people it might be, but for those of us mostly on the ship, it's so important to us that we wear it correctly and really show just how significant it was because it was so groundbreaking. From a personal standpoint, one of the reasons that I get almost emotional talking about the uniform is, um, I actually served in the Air Force myself, and I have a uniform of my own. And the first time I was at a history event um, was when I was a World War II history event. I hadn't really quite thought about doing World War II history, even though I've always loved history. Um, I was sitting next to somebody who had served in the Navy in World War II, and on her other side was a wasp. And the wasps had some issues with the uniform and title and status. And it kind of occurred to me up to that point that taking, I was taking my own uniform for granted. I go to basic training, it gets handed to me, I didn't have to fight for it. But when I was sitting there talking to these women at this event, I realized that I took my uniform for granted because they fought for it. They fought for me and they fought for every woman that gets to wear a uniform now, that gets to be a uniformed member of the United States military and not just an auxiliary on the side that can be disposed of when the war is over. So the uniform does have a lot of significance. It helped reinforce the idea that women could serve and it showed that we could do it and we could do it beautifully. Um, and it also gave them something to be proud of. Um, a lot of women did truly value their uniforms and it does, it shows.